That's it, preparing to go live now. Afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's Advice Line Live event. Um, this afternoon, I'm absolutely delighted to have Ross Parker, Community Advisor, who's from our Advice Line team. Um, Ross will be on hand to share some advice and maybe some practical support suggestions around sensory processing. Um, so welcome, Ross, and yeah. thank you for joining us this afternoon. Lovely to be here. Yep. So Ross, we hear through our advice line um, and some of our other community offerings, um, like the post-diagnostic support for parents and carers are get set for autism, that they're looking for specific support and strategies around sensory processing. Um, but more generally as well around kind of environments and how they can obviously play a role in terms of sensory processing, such as schools and workplace, workplaces where maybe difficulties or challenges can arise. And I'm wondering whether um, you can share for the, for the viewers this afternoon, maybe some of the inquiries that we receive and what people reach out to um, as using the you know, advice line in relation to sensory processing. Yep, a common one we've had recently with the schools going back has been people inquiring about school uniforms, especially around transition, say, from primary school to high school when they've had seven years of wearing a polo shirt and then they're expected to go to high school and wear a shirt and tie mm -hmm. and what they can do with the school and or the local authority to uh, mitigate the circumstances and the different textures mm -hmm. and the feeling of scratchiness even going to high school having to wear a blazer with a badge on it and just asking what we can advise and asking what local authority policy is, for example, and to what they can do to allow their child to be on an even, not to be disadvantaged when they go to school. Because mm -hmm. I can imagine, obviously, in terms of school uniforms, if they are kind of getting that kind of sensory difference in terms of that kind of scratchiness or, or kind of uncomfortableness, I guess, you know, in terms of um, people's education, that can obviously impact that their learning and their attention and maybe their concentration as well then, Ross. Exactly. And it's, that's it. It's finding out what, what the school, what we as an advice link can advise them to do just to put them at the same level. It's not, that's why it's a reasonable adjustment to allow them to find a way that they'd be comfortable in that environment. And as mm -hmm. we said earlier, it's the, you know, the polo shirt mm -hmm. and going to the, the polyester shirt, which isn't pleasant for Anyone that's ever had to wear a polyester shirt will know. And yeah, and just what we can adapt. I know some uh, schools with additional needs departments are quite happy to allow their students to wear a, a hoodie with the school logo on it, as that allows them to stay comfortable and allows them to still learn, but to have the school badge on their uniform means that they're still recognisable and anyone visiting the school knows there are people, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess obviously schools may come up with different suggestions as well in terms of being able to support that. Um, and I guess in terms of the advice line, um, we do also get in, you know, a variety of different inquiries. It's not just about school and the school uniform. I, you know, I, I'm aware that we get inquiries in terms of workplace and, 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 and the reasonable adjustments that potentially can be considered from a sensory perspective. Um, and I know that we kind of get sometimes inquiries around things like around kind of visiting the dentist or even going to get your hair cut, for example. Um, so we, we do get a wide range of inquiries, don't we, Ross, through the advice line for, the, for, the, for this type of kind of topic of conversation, shall we say? We do. We get loads and it can range from parents of young children to autistic people that are well into adulthood and mm -hmm. just. You know, it's taking the step back and thinking how many different sensory processes there are that can affect mm -hmm. you. The, the dentist is a very good example. The dentist is usually warm, the sound of the dental equipment, the, the sights, they try their best with fish tanks and mood, moodful light, but it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's, it's worth taking a step back and thinking, and a lot of our autistic people do, especially if this is the first time going back, say, after a couple of years after COVID, mm -hmm. and thinking... The world has changed. I now I'm not in a position to cope with that. Mm -hmm. Could you advise me? Mm -hmm. And we get several of them, and we are always very happy to 
help with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. We are happy for people to kind of get in touch with the advice line in relation to these types of inquiries. Um, and I, I guess, uh, you know, we're, we're happy for questions to come in this afternoon um, if, if people are wanting to ask any questions for myself or Ross. Um, before the event, we've had a kind of couple of questions come through already. And Ross, I hope you're OK for us to maybe kind of talk through some of those. Um, so one of them is a very kind of specific question that came through um, and basically that they're, they're struggling with their work environment and looking for some headphones to potentially, you know, um, either speak to their employee about purchasing or kind of looking for themselves and and they're wondering whether we can recommend headphones at all and I guess um wondering whether you can maybe share some insight around that Ross in terms of what we would kind of suggest we could certainly try it it's, I mean it's you know yourself better than anyone and it's up to you how you how you perceive things some people will really like the big over ear ear defenders mm -hmm. and that is really beneficial to them to block out the noise and allow them to solely focus on their work some people either for not wanting to look different which is a very valid concern or some people don't like the sensory sensation of having their ears fully covered are far happier with just little earbuds mm -hmm. and I mean that's it. It's it's the they're the kind of two main ones, and it's mm -hmm. worth thinking about it. Maybe talking with your employer. You can of mm -hmm. course contact the advice line and talk about it in more depth, and see what you think would benefit you, because some people, as I say, will be really happy with the big ear defenders, as that blocks out the outside world, which can be a huge thing for people. Or some people, for a number of reasons, are far happier with just the the small earbuds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a it's a very good point there, Ross, in terms of, you know, people will have different preferences in terms of um, what types of headphones they may want to consider. Um, it's a very good point in terms of, you know, thinking about, you know, obviously headphones are primarily there to, to help with maybe the noise within, within the work environment, but then obviously you need to consider the other kind of sensory aspect in terms of, you know, the, the tactile feel of them um, being worn as well. So, very valid points and you know we would always recommend for people to get in touch with us and we're happy to kind of talk through what preferences individuals may have to help prepare have that conversation with their employer potentially around some of that um i, I guess you know other questions that have come in um that we've had a few in terms of haircuts um and i guess um we'll take those by, by turn um so one individual has got in touch to say that their son um, does not cope well with having the haircut um, and they've always gone to the same barbers, but this is becoming more and more difficult each time. Do we have any suggestions? It's difficult, a hairdresser. I mean, I know many families from advice line experience and personal experience who found a barber when the child was young and have just gone with them and that's worked so far but as you're saying Zafia with coming out of Covid with just the changing way the world is that's sometimes not working anymore and it is really hard especially when that's the routine they've got mm -hmm. it's worth maybe looking or having a think yourself has something changed in the shop is it as simple as there's new lighting in is there you know is there now a radio or a television on that there never used to be that's now an extra noise or it can even be something that sounds quite silly but is really valid have they changed the clippers they use and that's now a different pitch and noise that you wouldn't even think about when you're buying the clippers mm -hmm. but that might just be and especially given how close it is to your head and maybe more the point in your ears then that can really affect someone and that's why something that has worked for so long might no longer be working Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, for that type of inquiry as well, there's no harm in getting in touch with the advice line where we can maybe explore that and take it through step by step in terms of why maybe things are becoming more and more difficult. And I guess, you know, some people haven't been for a haircut for a very long time for some individuals as well. So, yeah, um, interesting points there, Ross. And the other one that we've had around hair is um, someone's daughter who really dislikes having her hair brushed. 
um, and it results in a lot of crying and, and quite a, a kind of physical reaction for, for, for her daughter. And I guess she's wondering what she can do to help help her brush her hair as her hair's getting quite matted and obviously children at school are beginning to notice that as well. And that can be, again, if you're a child at school, some children can be really horrible. So that's another, another layer to that. I mean, that's the thing with a hairbrush. It's something that most of us just do without thinking about, but a hairbrush can actually be really quite painful mm -hmm. if you have hypersensitivity in your head or your hair. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, again, with the, the hair cut, it's worth maybe thinking, was there a reason that that happened? You know, and that mm -hmm. could be puberty developing and, you know, the the body changing or it could be additional stress or it could be even a different type of brush mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's worth you know thinking could is there a way around it can you do something with the hair mm -hmm. to keep it clean and not getting matted without having to resort to which is probably quite forceful brushing yeah yeah I mean um, I've had conversations with parents myself sometimes about considering what type of brush you're using obviously you can get quite hard bristled brushes which can feel you know for some individuals quite painful and unforceful so we've spoken about tangle teasers for example um and you know you mentioned there in terms of you know is there something that can be done with the hair to kind of prevent that that matting almost and maybe reduce the amount that you need to brush your hair and I've spoken to individuals in the past about, you know, especially for, for girls pleating their hair, for example, mm -hmm. um, or even using things like silk pillow cases if, if that's comfortable for them, because it means actually the hair's potentially getting less matted and thinking about, you know, the, the kind of um, products that you're using in the hair as well to maybe try and prevent some of that. So, you know, the points you've raised are, are really valid. And again, we would encourage people to get in touch so we can kind of explore things further in relation to that as well um because there might be a couple of other things at play there as well like you say in terms of um height and stress for example um so no thank you ross we've started to have a couple of questions come in so i'm going to kind of look at some other live questions mm -hmm. that have come through um aileen has commented to say that her son has changed so much since lockdown and is so sensitive to noise now he's hitting his head a lot and always has his fingers in his ears as though it's causing him pain and he's now prone, obviously, to ear infection. So it's hard to know if it's sensory or an infection as he's non-verbal. Is there anything we can do at home in terms of everyday living to reduce general noise? And are there noise reducing electronic items, for example? Yes, and we've heard that a few times about circumstances changing due to, due to COVID. And we had those two or three months when your home was your world mm -hmm. and some autistic people have really struggled to get back out and about but in terms of the sensory issues or infection it might be both and it's a it's a, a vicious circle the sensory issues putting the ears into putting the fingers in the ears to stop the sensory issues I mean there might be an, an inner ear infection which will then cause more sensory issues because that would be painful so it's worth thinking at home it's worth being mindful how even things you maybe don't think about, how loud the television is. Uh, did you get a new coffee maker or something that's quite noisy? So just thinking what has changed since COVID around the home that we usually wouldn't even think about and just working out, is that a reason? If you can't think of one, again, by all means, get in contact with the advice line and we can discuss that in depth with you. Mm -hmm. It sounds like quite a complicated one. And like mm -hmm. you say, Ross, you know, it could be a bit of both. It could be an inner ear infection, but also at the same time, that sensory aspect. Um, and I think, you know, we need to be mindful of that. And I guess what, what we would encourage you to do is, you know, if ever in doubt is getting that medical kind of advice first and foremost in terms of that, is it an inner ear infection? Um, and obviously kind of getting antibiotics or, or whatever you need to kind of clear that that up for your, your son. Um, but then at the same time, it could well be a sensory thing and it could be high, heightening 
that, that, that kind of sensory experience for your son as well. So I think it's about getting in touch with us. We can talk to you about kind of the general noise within your home. And I know some parents sometimes have had to consider maybe using certain items within the home when the child's not home as well, um, just to reduce the amount of noise that, that's kind of going on at, at home. Um, but again, we can have a conversation and talk about that in terms of maybe is there specific things that actually we can target and think about um, in terms of that, that sensory experience for your son. And I guess, you know, he's using his ears to, to kind of block out that noise. Is it something to consider in terms of headphones? But like we've spoken already, that there are kind of those other complexities around that when you're considering headphones. And, it, you know, it's not for everyone either um, in terms of whether they want to use those. Um, so thank you, Aileen. Hopefully that's answered some of your question. And obviously, you know, feel free to comment again if, if there's something else that you want to add to that. Um, We've had quite a few comments um, around kind of um, an autism assessment. Um, what we'd encourage you to do around those kind of types of questions is get in touch with the advice line. Um, and we'd be more than happy to kind of give you some pointers around that. Um, obviously today we're focusing on the, the sensory processing side of things. Um, I'm just having a look at some of the other questions that have come through because we've had a very quick spate of um, comments. Uh, uh, somebody's made a suggestion about just going back to our co uh, conversation around hair Ross someone's actually mm -hmm. commented to say child's farm detangling spray and tangle teaser from home bargains is the only one myself and little girl find comfortable so that's quite a good suggestion Excellent. from somebody haven't heard of those before um, so thank you for sharing that Sarah um, another person's commented, Laura, saying she can't stand loud noises and has a pair of noise cancelling headphones and love them. And yes, I wasn't like this before COVID. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Laura. It's always good to hear about the general public and autistic people and their families think it's always good. We always consider the advice line in our training a two-way process and we might have the autism knowledge, but you all out there have experience as well. So it's always wonderful to hear your contributions. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a, quite a few comments coming through. Um, one person, that's specifically Angela, has um, asked whether we've got any kind of strategies or supports for an individual who is kind of quite distressed and experienced kind of um, what they've described violent meltdowns. Um, they're only midway through an assessment, um, but I guess I wonder whether we could just unpick some of that, Ross, um, and just, you know, I guess in terms of strategies, it depends what what the, the 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 kind of struggle is in terms of that but i wonder whether you could just unpick that from a sensory perspective ross um what strategies and supports might be out there yeah it's worth i mean we've mentioned a few there might be headphones i mean we often talk to people and remind them to have a think about if there's something that causes it is it you know for example is it always when they come home from school and is that maybe that they're masking at school to try and fit in and therefore by the time they get home from school they're exhausted and then that's them back at their safe place as their home and then that's when they let the emotion out and unfortunately as parents it's them that usually get it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's worth remembering sensitive things and might be you know I'm saying coming home from school again, this is just an example, you know, is there a new thing opened on the way home from school that is an extra sensory process that they weren't used to? Mm -hmm. It could be anything, a new shop's opened with smells coming out, that someone's got a new dog that barks, you know, that could be anything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe just trying to work out the cause of it. Mm -hmm. and just... Yeah. yeah. And I think that's generally for any kind of um, type of situation, it's looking at maybe what what's maybe happening beforehand in terms of for that individual. And Angela, Angela, I'd really encourage you to get in touch with the advice line because we'd be able to kind of give you some some maybe some advice and support, even though he's midway through the assessment process, we'd be more than happy to kind of give you some some support at this time in terms of strategies that, that may or may not be, you know, work work for for, for your three year old. But um it's kind of, a, I guess, a bit of trial and error in terms of strategy sometimes um, to find the right thing for your child. So feel free to please get in touch with the advice line. 
Um, one of our other questions that came in before the event today, just making sure I'm covering both avenues mm -hmm. here. Um, another one of our questions was from an individual looking for advice on what they should consider when setting up a sensory room mm -hmm. and wondering what we can suggest in relation to this. Yeah, it's worth remembering that a sensory room doesn't have to be a dark room with lights and ambient music. A sensory room can be anything that suits the needs of your person. Your person, sorry. Anything that suits the needs of the autistic person or indeed yourself, if that's who you're making it for. And it, again, it's, it's person-centred and knowing what the personal preferences are. Some will be a dark room with ambient music playing. Some might be quite tactile. And if it's touch that the person really benefits from, it might be lots of different fabrics or different sensory objects. And remembering we have at least five senses and that they all play a, a big part and to manage those stimulations can make a huge difference to someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess through the advice I'm picking up on that point, we're also about... Um, you know, can have an impact for individuals, I guess, you know, sometimes we hear from parents who talk about obviously their children, again, we're going to talk about school, but children that are at school, uh, where they have regular breaks throughout the day, and some of them do go and access a sensory room. Um, but for some individuals, it's not quite meeting their needs, because it, it isn't quite um, I guess an adaptable and flexible space to meet those sensory needs that those individuals have um, and I guess that's the point you were trying to raise there Ross is that actually in terms of a, a, as a sensory room you need to consider kind of who's going to be accessing that if it's for a group of people you need to consider the community that's going to be using that sensory room if it's a sensory room at home you can tailor that very much to to your ch child or young person or even you know adults have contacted us in terms of having that space at mm. home for themselves and um, so it's kind of knowing what what works for them um, so I get you know there's that complexity in terms of understanding um, I guess individuals sensory profiles and what that looks like and they can change as well as people kind of get older and um, as they develop but also um, you know we've touched upon it already if somebody's stressed as well that actually there can be times where actually there's certain sensory stimulus that actually is too much in that moment as well so thank you Ross that was really helpful I'm just looking at some of the other questions that are coming through. We've got Aileen again, who's come back with another question. Um, and she's asking whether we have any tips around brushing teeth for someone who finds it too sensory. Hmm. That's a very good question. Again, it's, it's figuring out, you know, is it the, if you use a manual toothbrush, is it worth finding quite a, a gentle electric toothbrush, which you can get? Is it the, the taste of the mint toothpaste maybe that's a bit overwhelming? You can get other flavours. Is, is it the environment? Is it the, you know, the associated anxiety with it and just kind of being a bit more fluid in your approach to it, shall we say, and not, yes, it's an important part of the bedtime routine, but maybe not if there is that built-up anxiety for it, which there may be, you know, working out another strategy that you could find a way to make that less stressful for your young person. Yep, yeah. And like you say, there's lots of different flavoured toothpaste out there. Um, there's also a variety of different brushes out there. But I think, like you say, Ross, it's important to maybe have that more fluid approach um, in terms of brushing the teeth, especially if there's that already anxiety around that particular, I'm going to say, task. Um, but I guess, you know, again, in terms of that particular situation, Aileen, and I know you've already said you're going to contact the advice line um, potentially, but Aileen, I, I would I would get in touch and we can we can unpick that a bit more in terms of your child specifically and, and seeing, you know, what 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 we can maybe suggest and recommend. Um, so please, yeah, please do get in touch. Um, just having a look at some of the other comments that are coming up. We've had Karen who's getting got in touch in relation to university. Oh, uh -huh. um, but around not being able to keep up and skipping a year um, of education. 
she's currently struggling for to find employment um, and not sure what she can do I guess you know in terms of the work environment Karen if oh, you're saying you're using your mum's account but who, who's using mum's account under Karen um, if you get in touch with us we've got an, a couple of suggestions that we mm -hmm. can make it in terms of that um, again it's not in, in keeping with the kind of theme today but there are some kind of um supports out there that that can help you maybe kind of find employment um, and give you some coaching support around that um, and I guess you know in terms of the the sensory aspect today again we can we can have a you know conversation with you on the advice line either by phone live chat or email um, around maybe some of the things that if you were to go into employment you know supports that you may need in terms of that um, especially when employers, you know, depend on the work environment. I'm just thinking out loud here. Some are moving to much more kind of open plan offices where you can hot desk, which, you know, can create various different um, difficulties in relation to that sensory side of things, dependent on where you're sitting in the office, for example. Um, you might only have a desk that's available by a water cooler, for example. But there's a lot of different, um, different kind of struggles around that. Um, Again, for those that I'm not kind of coming through to on, on the, the kind of comments coming through, um, I would encourage you to get through with through to the advice line and we can obviously unpick some of those um those kind of scenarios um you know with you via via our advice line. Um because again, we're getting quite a few around autism assessment at this moment in time. So um one final kind of um pre-question that we were asked prior to the to the event today was um this is from a kind of autistic parent, but also they have two autistic children at home and um, they live in quite a close house. And um, so, it's, you know, quite I think it feels quite um, quite busy within the home, shall we say. Um, and they're just wondering how do, how can they go about considering how they manage all their different sensory needs? Because what the parent was saying is that, you know, the children's sensory needs are very different for her and she's struggling to kind of, I guess, get the sensory needs that she requires at this moment in time. Yep, and it's worth remembering all good parents will put their child needs first, but remembering, especially if you're an autistic parent yourself, to look after your own needs. And it can be hard if the child has a tablet that has a particular game that they are absolutely thrilled with, but it's loud and that can be really overwhelming for the parent. For anybody, you know, encourage you know, maybe encourage the children to use headphones, ear defenders, as we've touched on a few times, you know, and remembering as the parent to make time for yourself. Mm -hmm. And to, if you need to use the time after the kids are in bed to decompress, as we sometimes call it, just to have some time to just chill and to be an autistic person, then by all means have it. You're perfectly entitled to your own free time and we hear that so much, especially when I get set for autism. Mm -hmm. Parents that say, oh, always make sure my children are fine and I'll be okay. But you need to remember, especially if you're autistic yourself, to make time for yourself and to make sure that you're coping and thriving as well. Exactly, yeah. And I think, you know, some, you know, this is something that we get through quite regularly, I think, in terms of, um, you know, autistic parents specifically, and how to kind of obviously, you know, look after their own needs, um, with with a change, you know, the changes happen in terms of they've had, they've had a child, they've had, you know, children, and actually, that's a big change, not just from a sensory perspective, but a change in routine, it's another, it's another person to kind of look after it changes an awful lot within, I guess, a household. Um, but yeah, in terms of those sensory needs, like you say, Ross, it's important that as a parent, they, they get that time for them and um, to be able to decompress and, and, and meet those needs that they have. Um, and, you know, I guess living in quite a close, close house in a busy house that can sometimes feel quite difficult. Um, and I guess it's, you know, is there is there a small space within that home that you can identify for just being for you? Um, or is there kind of, you know, spaces that you can kind of spread out within the home fit for each and every one of you, which is easier said than done sometimes with dependent on the living arrangements that you have. Um, but yeah, no, making sure that parents meet their own needs is extremely important or autistic or not, but obviously more so for, for those autistic parents and um, where maybe they aren't kind of getting those sensory needs met mm -hmm. um, in terms of that, because it can add to that stress and anxiety for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Um, I'm just looking to see if we have any more kind of questions that have come through the live event today. Um, again, a lot of the questions are in relation to assessment, um, which we know is a, is a struggle for a lot of people maybe accessing an autism assessment. Um, and again, you know, we can give some really relevant advice, support and guidance in relation to that um, through our advice line and how you can navigate some of that. Um, it can be a challenge and, and we do hear about that quite regularly from individuals. Um, some individuals are looking for pre-diagnostic support as well. Again, you know, get in touch with us um, through the advice line and we're more than happy to kind of explore what pre-diagnostic support may be available um, in your area. Again, it, you know, sometimes it's helpful for us to be aware of people's local authorities to be able to, mm -hmm. to kind of advise as to what support groups might be available locally. Um, but again, get in touch with the advice line and we can, we can respond to that, you know, personally to you. Um, Again, some people, again, struggling to get GP appointments. Um, I think everyone's having that struggle across the board at the moment. Um, and, you know, with that, you're struggling with the phone consultations and I cannot understand why, why that might be the case as well. Um, so again, Vonnie, please, 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 please do get in touch with the advice line. Um, I'm not seeing anything else. I mean, apologies if I've missed anyone, um, but I'm not seeing anyone else. Um, Kind of having any specific questions in relation to our kind of theme today in terms of sensory processing um i guess you know if anyone's got any questions about the event today in terms of sensory processing or anything autism related i would encourage you to all get in touch with um the advice line where myself and ross are part of that team you may well find that it's one of us at the other end of the phone um but feel free to get in touch by phone email or live chat and again it can be either of us at any end of that communication method that you decide to get in touch via um, it's open tuesday to friday 10 till 4 um, and we'd be more than happy to kind of respond to any inquiries um you know personally um and and kind of exploring some of those those further with you all um so thank you ross this afternoon for joining me with this advice line event um, i hope everyone's enjoyed the event and has found some of the kind of conversation helpful um, please do get in touch with the advice line and I hope everyone has a, a good afternoon. Thank you.